Okay. So I don't know about you guys, but a lot of the meetings that we go to, um, there's so much false information that's um, uh, talked about regarding CWD. Uh, as an example, I always hear that CWD started in a game farm. Well, they forget to leave out the very important part that uh, it started at a research facility. So I put together this uh, slideshow presentation, talk a little bit about the history of deer farming, uh, how CWD has affected us, and um, uh, we try to stay away from any um, opinions. Uh, most everything in here is either fact or science-based. <clears throat> So this is a document that was created in 1908 and it was uh, created by President Teddy Roosevelt where he was encouraging states to adopt uh, deer and elk farming. Um, he, he even mentions how it's a, a way to use land that wasn't suited for any other type of agriculture. And so uh, in the summary, it said, instead of hampering breeders by restrictions as at present, state laws should be modified as to encourage the raising of deer, elk, and other animals as a source of profit to the individual and to the state. And unfortunately, we're living at a time now where the government is trying to take away our right to deer farm. So this is a restaurant in the Minneapolis area. We started uh, providing them with homegrown whitetail carcasses back in September. And they've already been awarded the restaurant of the year in the Minneapolis area. So we're kind of excited about this new market. And for those of you who are going to be around tomorrow, we are going over to the restaurant tomorrow at uh, 2 o'clock. And the chef is going to demonstrate all of the different uh, venison dishes that they uh, provide. Um, it's a great restaurant Charlie and I went over there oh let's say a couple months ago and they treated us like royalty it was kind of uh, exciting they, they were like you guys are the deer farmers that are providing this great venison this is a little history of TSEs um, it's important to point out that Scrapey was first identified in 1730 CJD, that's the TSE for humans, was discovered in 1920. CWD was first reported in 1967, and that was in the research facility in Colorado. Uh, first reports of BSE, 1986. So I found this document online. <clears throat> um, it's chronic wasting disease linked to Fort Collins for 50 years, and it was uh, printed in August of 2018. It's a great document, and uh, it has a little bit of the history of CWD. Um, so this is one of the, the people that was interviewed. He worked at the Fort Collins uh, research facility. Now, they don't know if when they brought in the wild mule deer, if they brought the disease into the research facility, or there's speculation that it could have crossed the species barrier from scrapies because they were doing scrapie research. So it could have transferred from the sheep to the deer, but we'll never know. So on the back of this article is the history of CWD and I highly recommend you guys print this off and give it to your legislators. So in 1967, uh, chronic wasting disease was observed in the captive mule deer at the Colorado State University. In uh, 78 to 81, the wasting syndrome was observed in the Toronto Zoo mule deer that was transferred from the Denver Zoo. In 1979, it was recognized in captive mule deer at the Wyoming Research Facility. In 1981, it was detected in wild elk in Colorado. In 1985, it was detected in wild mule deer in Colorado and Wyoming. 
1996 was the first detection in a captive elk farm in Saskatchewan. So it was around for 30 years before they found it behind fence. And that's important to point out. So unfortunately, the Saskatchewan case came from the United States. And that person had uh, either purchased or gotten animals from the research facility in Colorado. So once again, we were victims of the disease. They didn't know at that time how serious this was. So that's how it got to game farms. This is the original where CWD was in Colorado, Wyoming, and uh, Nebraska. And this is where we're at today. Huge, huge uh, distribution of CWD. <clears throat> so we'll talk a little bit about all of these uh, different areas. Now, it's obvious that the majority of the CWD in our farms is, is related to the CWD in the wild because most of the dots that you'll see, uh, the yellow and the red dots are captivity. Um, the red are the ones that are still in uh, business and the yellow are ones that were depopulated. So we talked about the CWD up here in Canada came from the United States. Then we have, um, you take a look over here in New York, that actually was a taxidermist and he also had animals that he brought in from the wild, um, rehabilitated fawns. Um, Pennsylvania, it's obvious that their CWD is connected to the CWD in the wild. Wisconsin, you know, we started out down here and it's gradually, it is spreading in Wisconsin to areas where it has not yet been found in a couple of those counties, but uh, we all know they don't test at the same rate that we do. So was it already there and infected our farms? You know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Um, you know, this is all the, the beginning of CWD. Uh, you had a lot of elk farms out there that were um, infected. And I like to point out this area in here. So there's no positives found in the uh, captive um, farmed industry in those areas. So we have to point out where is this disease coming from? How is it spreading to these states? And some of these don't even allow deer farming, but I would like to point out don't, um, don't uh, state false statements. Um, so in Tennessee, some people say that there are no game farms. There are, there are there's elk farms and there are fallow farms. There are no whitetail farms, but you have to be careful with your wording so that you're saying the correct information. So um, these states have not been able to, to blame it on uh, deer farming. This is a map put together by Brian um, Richards from USGS. And I think when Brian put this together, he didn't realize that the captive or this, the farmed industry was gonna use this. Um, so we have, uh, let me grab my notes here so I give you the correct information. <clears throat> so what Brian did is he took the zip codes from the the hunters who hunted in the four highly infected counties in Wisconsin. And there were 32,000 hunters that came from areas of Wisconsin and 49 other states. So every dot on this map represents a hunter that harvested a deer in the CWD highly infected areas in Wisconsin. And the reason this is important is because it shows the risk that these carcasses are playing as far as hunters possibly taking home CWD infected carcasses. And who knows what they're doing with them on the landscape. And the other thing I like to point out that obviously these hunters were not too concerned about CWD because why would they flock 
to the four highly infected counties if they were concerned about CWD. The reason is because those four counties have trophy bucks. So they went to hunt for trophy animals. Were these wild? All wild? wild. These are all wild, yes. We can do very little about the deer-to-deer -deer movement of disease, but the human-assisted is where regulatory efforts and educational efforts can have their greatest impact. Probably the biggest risk of, of disease spreading is the inadvertent movement of infectious materials or carcasses by hunters. If you are hunting in an area where CWD is known to exist, check the rules and regulations of your home state or locale to determine what is safe to bring back home. If by chance you have killed a CWD positive animal and brought it back to your home state, you should make every effort to appropriately discard those materials. Do not allow those materials to end up out on the landscape where healthy deer in your area could come across them and become infected with this disease. Now that is Brian Richards from USGS telling hunters how um, they have to be careful with these carcasses. And that's what I like to tell the DNRs around the country. They have to do a better job of educating hunters about the risk of, of these carcasses. Um, most hunters don't want to bring CWD back to their area. So they want to do the right thing and dispose of these carcasses properly. But most of them don't know about this high risk. This is a research paper by uh, Dr. Harry Jacobson, Dr. Davin Henderson, and Dr. Nicholas Haley. So they, uh, deter they determined the um, parts of the animal that are the most infectious. And you'll see that the brain, the carcass, the lymphoid tissue is at the very top. That is the, the most uh, infectious material. And then you go down, um, blood, s saliva, and feces are lower on the list. And then when it comes to urine, they actually did this for the urine industry, uh, this research paper, and they determined that it would take 33 gallons of urine to infect an animal with CWD. 33,000 gallons, okay, sorry about that. Yeah, that makes a big difference, but uh, nowhere in nature are you gonna see an animal drinking that much urine. So the, the, the banning of the urine around the um, country is not a necessary thing. So these are some of the known ways that CWD can be spread, um, the infected carcasses, uh, birds of prey, they could be feasting on um, an infected carcass and they do excrete the prions in their feces. Uh, predators, coyotes can also excrete prions in their feces. Live deer movements, and we like to point out that our herd certification program through USDA has helped to prevent the spread of uh, CWD by this means. Um, I, I hear a lot of people say that they don't think our CWD herd certification program is working because there's been um, certified herds that have tested positive for CWD. And I make the argument that I think it is working because we're finding the disease in the early stages before the disease is spread all around the country. And that's important. And that last you have the infected uh, free ranging deer and of course we cannot control their movement. These are ways that some people think that CWD could be spread, and that's hay and other feed sources, and the scientists and researchers I've talked to just do not believe that there's enough prions in the feed sources to contaminate or to infect an animal with CWD. Nose-to-nose -nose contact, we don't have enough research to prove that uh, a nose-to-nose -nose can uh, cause CWD. Um, deer farmers are almost always blamed when CWD shows up in a new area. And that's because we're testing at 100% in most cases. And the wildlife agencies are testing at less than 1%. So who do you think is going to find it first? As Gary's favorite saying, uh, we, we are the canary in the coal mine. 
So how did CWD get to Wisconsin? Uh, some people speculate that it could have been carcasses that came from, say, Colorado. Uh, farm deer are all also um, uh, pointed at as a possible source, but I'd like to point out that in Wisconsin, all of the first cases of CWD behind fence in our farmed herds came from animals that we purchased from the wild when it was legal to do so. So we were able to buy fawns from the DNR for $25 an animal, plus they had programs like in Milwaukee in their parks where the herds were too populated and they would allow deer farmers to come in and bid on these uh, animals and, and uh, move these animals to their farms. So that's no longer legal to do now that they realize the risk that was there. So th there's speculation that it could have came from uh, Beth Williams, who was a researcher out in Colorado, and, um, or, or was she Wyoming? One of the two places. So we do have a research paper that says that in 1998, uh, the University of Wisconsin received a gift from Beth Williams um, with CWD. I point this out is this is all the deer farms in Wisconsin and you put a map overlay of uh, the CWD in the wild and I like to point out that if we really were the cause of CWD why would we not be seeing CWD throughout the whole state so um, a lot of these recent cases are farms that are have CWD in the wild and they're becoming the victims of CWD spreading into their their farms from the wild. We don't know how it's getting into our pens but it's obvious there's there's a connection. Uh, these are the CWD affected counties and as I pointed out before we do have some that are in areas of the state and that's why we had such a problem this last year with uh, the hunters complaining to the governor that um, the, these deer farmers are spreading CWD throughout the state and you need to do something. Now this is the only opinion that you'll find in this document and this is my opinion only but I, I believe in Wisconsin that CWD is used for three reasons. The DNR is adamant that we have to get rid of baiting and feeding. So when they find CWD in a new county, they eliminate baiting and feeding. And that's when the hunters become upset with the deer farmers because, oh my gosh, that deer farm brought CWD to our county and now we can no longer bait and feed. And I, I don't think um, that they should have a ban when it's found behind fence because it's contained. Uh, the second is an excuse to cull the animals where the herd has grown out of control. And the third is to eliminate or regulate deer farms out of business. Are there solutions and treatments? Uh, there was a recent uh, research article that came out this past year about humic acid um, being able to uh, um, destroy the prions. Um, we do have a gentleman going to speak about this at the White Tills of Wisconsin banquet. Um, um, the research is in the early stages so we don't know quite yet how well it's going to work but it is a possibility that it could be used on the farm fields. I don't think it's highly likely that it would work in, in the uh, wooded areas. Tetracycling, there's some research papers that uh, tend to think that tetracycling is a way to prevent uh, CWD in our farms. CWD resistance, this is new on the horizon with Dr. Haley's research. Um, there's, it, it, there's a good sign that we could have a solution with the CWD resistance. Now we don't know how resistant these animals are, so we're hoping that we can get this research project going in Wisconsin where we will actually challenge these animals with the double markers and um, hope that uh, 
like Dr. Haley told me, he said, we don't need an animal that's completely resistant. Even if we can find animals that are five years resistant, most of us don't keep them on our farm that long. So we can turn these animals around, or, or, or move them off of our farms before they even contract CWD. But it's, it's highly important, important that we prove this research. So the other thing is no one really knows when the prions are being shed. So you'll hear a lot of the naysayers um, that don't want us to have a resistant animal. They'll say that, uh, well, these animals are shedding prions longer, so they're, they're spreading the disease for a longer period of time. Well, nobody really knows that because we need more research. So that's going to be part of this research project in Wisconsin if, we, if it does get approved. So I, the last meeting I was at on Saturday had a gentleman that, um, after I got done talking, he started saying how there's something wrong with these resistant animals. And, you know, you guys could be just breeding um, bad genetics into your herd. So it made me realize that I had to put a few slides in here to, to prove otherwise. So there's been enough farmed animals tested around the country to where we know that these animals with these more resistant markers are totally healthy. I have some uh, does on my farm that have the K marker and they're consistently throwing triplets every year. There's nothing wrong with these animals. Um, I even have one K marker doe that uh, gives me uh, quads every year. So these are a couple kg bucks on my farm. As you can see, the antlers look fine. Uh, they, they show no um, signs of something wrong with them. So that's important to pass on to the naysayers when they uh, criticize this resistance. These are two animals in Texas that are KS bucks. And uh, I was told that gladiator uh, actually is even uh, EHD resistant. So um, there's nothing wrong with these markered animals and we have to stop these naysayers from uh, continuing to um, say otherwise. This is a um, research done in the uh, Wyoming research facility. Um, so this is elk, and the MM animals are what they consider the most susceptible. They lived on average four years before they contracted the disease and died. Uh, so the ML lived on average seven years, and the LL, which are the most resistant, unknown. Some of them were up to 13 years. So. In my mind, when the naysayers talk about resistance and uh, there's no animal that's completely resistant, they kept us from breeding in that direction because of, of the negativity. So if you have an LL animal and it's going to live for 13 years and you have a whole herd of LLs, you're not even going to have to worry about CWD. So we need a chart like this um, with whitetail as well. And that's hopefully what this research will um, provide to us uh, in Wisconsin. So why are the resistant animals not more prevalent? You know, they, the naysayers use that as an excuse that there's something wrong with them why they're not, not more prevalent in the wild. It's important to know that the, the, the fawns, when they're born, they get one marker from mom and they get one marker from their dad. So if you, if, it, let's say in the wild there's a sire that, or a buck that's an SS, but the majority of the do does in the, in the wild are GGs, you're already going to lose one of those S's because all the fawns are going to be GS's. So what I found in my herd is because I didn't know what I had, I, I had a lot of KG does, but unfortunately not knowing what I had, I bred them to uh, GG bucks. So already I went backwards instead of forward. So that's why it's so important to know what your does are and what your breeder bucks are. 
and that way you can advance in the right direction. This is Dr. Haley's most recent uh, slide. He was given all of the samples from the depopulated herds um, so that he could test them for uh, the markers. So in the first column, whoops, sorry. Over here you have the GGs. Those are the most susceptible. And you can see, uh, according to his um, coloring here, these are the early stages in the lymph node. And then as it progresses, those would be the later stages in the brain. Um, I like to point this out. So when you get over to the SS animals, which is the markers that were the most uh, resistant before Dr. Haley's research, none of the SS animals have ever tested positive in the brain. Now why is that important? That they've only been positive in the lymph node. So if an animal is not going to be positive in the brain, they're never going to be clinical. So t that tells me the lymph node is doing what it's supposed to be doing. It's, it's screening out the disease and keeping it from getting to the brain. Same thing here with the, the KG. So for those that are new to the resistant, the K and the H are the new markers that Dr. Haley has discovered that are even more resistant than the SS's. But because these still have a G in them, um, they are becoming uh, positive in the lymph node only. Now these are low numbers, but this is where Dr. Haley's getting his um, information that these double marker animals have never been positive, never been CWD positive in all these herds that they've depopulated. So this is how you can become a CWD resistant herd. First you eliminate the GG animals from your herd. Then you can eliminate the GSs. And from there you'll, you'll have the SS, HG, KG. And if you want to go the step level or above that, then you remove the S's and the G's. And that's how you can become a CWD resistant herd. And when we say resistant, we're not saying immune because we don't know. We don't know if they eventually will get CWD. So you have to avoid using the terminology uh, immune. Um, I'm not going to go through these slides, but if anybody wants, I can send them to you. It just uh, tells you your ability to be, create um, the more resistant animals, depending on what the parents are. I got this information from Dennis Simpson the other day. So Dennis tested some wild deer in Michigan, and he actually found where there were some areas of the state that actually had some resistance. Um, the couple of the counties were GS and SS, and then he also had a county where they had some Ks. One was actually a KS, and he also had um, H. So now Dennis is talking with their department of DNR and they're talking about ways that maybe they can um, help the wild herd by increasing the antler restrictions and possibly no doe harvest in those areas so that they can become more prevalent. I'm not going to go through a lot of this because it's Wisconsin, but I like to point out how regulated our industry is. I, I hear a lot of, um, at these meetings, they say, well, we need more regulation on these deer farms. They're not doing enough. Well, when you start telling them all the things that we do, they go, oh, we didn't know that. You know, some people will say, well, they should have ear tags. Well, okay, we already have two forms of ID. In Wisconsin, we can't move an animal across the street without involving our veterinarian with uh, an inspection of our animals and a health certificate. And once you educate these people, the general public, with all the rules that we have, they take a step back and they don't point the finger because they realize what all we do. 
So in Wisconsin, we actually put together a best management practice and it shows the, all of these rules that we have to follow. We give them to our legislators, we give them to uh, the, the Conservation Congress, which are hunting groups that um, don't necessarily like what we do. Uh, we also came up with a, a best management